Hello and welcome to this edition of Creighton in the Community. My name is Joyce Bunger and I'll be your host. Today we're going to learn about a very innovative program at Creighton University. It's one that shows the love for journalism and the passion for justice. The program is called Backpack Journalism. With me today is Dr. John O'Keefe, who actually began the program, Backpack Journalism. Tell me a little bit about Backpack Journalism. Well, Backpack Journalism is actually a technical term that was coined by a journalist named Bill Gentile, or at least he claims to have coined it. And it, it doesn't really refer to kind of backpacking. It really is a reference to the kind of miniaturization of the equipment. So what used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and require really big and heavy equipment, now you can fit in a backpack. So you can put a, a really s nice camera and audio equipment in a basically a, a backpack the size of your average student day pack, and you can make a film quality or a, a cinema a quality film. So that's what backpack journalism refers to. But for us, what happened was I, I've been in the theology department, and I've been this is my 20th year at Creighton, but I've always thought it would be sort of fun to make documentaries. And about five years ago, I applied for uh, an endowed chair that we have here, the A.F. Jacobson Chair in Communication. And one of the things I said I wanted to do was explore the intersection of theology and the new media and filmmaking. And you know, I got the chair, which uh, has been really terrific. And so I approached a couple of colleagues in the journalism department, actually Carol Zugner first, who teaches uh, journalistic writing and feature writing, and asked her if she wanted to enter into a partnership between theology and journalism and create a class to make a film, have st a student-led project make, to make a film about a, an issue of the church's mission in the developing world. And you know, she thought it was a great idea. And then she recruited Tim Guthrie, who's also in the journalism department, to the project. And that's pretty much how it got started. So let's talk about some of these, your first program. What did you do? Well, the first, I, I wanted to go to Africa right away, but because I had been there, but uh, there was a little, Carol was a little nervous about that, and we decided that for the first go, we would go to the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. because we have the ILAC thing there, and a lot of experience in, in the DR. So we took students, uh, two years ago to the DR, we took nine students, and made a film about a Catholic deacon uh, uh, who works in a really poor neighborhood in Santiago. So that was the first project. So how do you prepare the students for this, for this show? Well, we meet uh, for once a month uh, during the spring semester, once we have the students, and we sort of teach them about what they're going to be doing. We talk to them about uh, how to actually, that they're not going there to just be tourists. They're going there to actually tell the story about what life is like in some of these places. And there's, there's actually something called poverty tourism where people go to look at poor places and just sort of worry about it or feel bad about it and then they go home and they don't do anything. So it's, it's something that people critique a lot that you know going just to the poorest places on earth and looking at them and actually feeling bad but doing nothing. So we try to tell students that you know we're not going to go there to be poverty tourists. You know part of the goal here is to actually get a sense of what's going on and to tell their story but also to come back and actually try to do something about it. So that, that's what, how, and so we prepare them over time to do that. And so um, the video last year was on the Dominican Republic. This yeah. year's is on Uganda. This year's on Uganda. So you got well, to Africa. We went to Uganda last year in 2011, and we're going to Uganda again this year in 2012. And last year's film was about the efforts of people to recover from a 20-year civil war. Uh, there was a guy named Joseph Kony that terrorized northern Uganda for 20 years, uh, abducting children, forcing them to become child <coughs> soldiers. It was, it's terrible what happened there. And so our focus in that film, this film is on actually the efforts of people to, to reconcile with people who have been involved in that conflict. How do you prepare the students to do the video? Well, we don't actually require that students have any prior experience in filmmaking or photography. So the first couple of days of the class, once we start, it starts really in earnest, and it's a five-week summer program. But once we start, we do something called video boot camp. And for two and a half days, we just immerse them in filmmaking and teach them the basics. And then it's been amazing how they really rise to the occasion. And both times, they've produced some really amazing results. 
And now once they have gone on these trips and have come back, how are the students telling the story? How are they finishing it, so to speak? Well, we ask them to come to screenings of the film or, and <coughs> in town and, and uh, actually talk about their experience. And we, we kind of hope that the film will actually raise some money for the people that we profile. So we ask the students to be mindful of that and when they're able to tell people stories and then point people to websites where they can actually make a difference in the lives of people. And now let's watch this year's documentary. We went to Uganda to discover what peace means to those who endured a brutal civil war. A war where children were the pawns of a rebel leader and where the world seemed to turn its back on the people of northern Uganda. Led by Joseph Kony, the Lord's Resistance Army terrorized northern Uganda for 22 years, from January 1986 to December 2008. During that time, tens of thousands were killed as many as 60,000 children were forced to become child soldiers, and more than one and a half million people were driven from their homes into displacement camps. During the war and after, the Catholic Church, a vibrant part of society in Uganda, offered a foundation of faith and strived to further the path of peace. We talked to priests who continue to work for peace, priests working for justice as their parishioners struggle to survive amid poverty and disease, to a bishop who tried to negotiate peace, to a Jesuit building a school to build hope for the future, and to a mother who practices forgiveness that staggers the imagination. Father Cyprian Ochen works in a rural parish that once was the site of a camp for internally displaced people. Thousands lived in huts, crowded close together as a way to try to keep themselves and their children safe from the rebels. To be honest, life was terrible because movement alone on the roads was so difficult. There were landmines being planted on the road, there were ambushes by the rebels, and uh, there were abductions of children, and uh, people eventually were displaced from their homes into the camps. And uh, as a result, there are people whose children have been abducted who are getting off their mind now. I think uh, the experience they went through is so terrible. Many are, 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 are becoming mentally disturbed. Yeah. Father Felix Opio explains the violence in the camps. During the war, he was the director for Caritas, a Catholic relief organization, and worked with the advocacy group, the Justice and Peace Commission. Uh, these camps became more or less a kind of a, a death trap for the, for the population. So when the government forced people into the camps, the situation became worse. Um, like putting people in the camp, that is a kind of structural violence imposed on the people but under the pretext of protecting them. We put you in the camp so that we protect you from the rebel. Hmm? But actually you are creating a structure that oppresses the people. People are no longer free, people are not given the services. Hmm? Supporting and building up, the, the, giving hope, a sense of hope to the people that, look, the situation is bad, yes, but we can still, we can still hope for a better time. Bishop Giuseppe Franzelli of Lira had been in Uganda for years. He was exiled for 18 years but returned in 2005. 
He had been involved in peace talks with Joseph Kony in Juba, Sudan, in addition to meeting with victims about breaking this vicious circle. A continuum no, of, of people uh, living together in a small space uh, in a inhuman way, and not just for a few weeks, or, you know, but months and years. And, that, and that, uh, indeed this was a change eh, for the worse. It's, uh, it went on for too long. And I think that on top of the uh, material destruction of, of uh, buildings, properties, and so on, uh, this has caused a kind of, you know, a real damage uh, to, the, to the inner fabric of, of, of people, their values, their mentality. Father Tony Walk laments the stigma that marked children who return from the bush, lives scarred by their abduction. Here, you had something like 25 or 30,000 people, mostly young children, young adults, abducted into the rebels. First thing they had to do was go kill their parents or kill their brother or their friend, okay? And then when those people come home, and many of them have come home if they didn't get killed, do you welcome your brother back in the house when he might have killed people in your village or killed people in your family? Many of the girls came back with children from some of the commanders. So girls show up with one or two or three babies to the parents, the grandparents, to the village, except these people. As slaughter, disease, and poverty engulfed the people of northern Uganda, those outside their borders barely even noticed. Yes, to, to, to some extent we felt uh, bad that uh, the rest of the Universal Church uh, somehow abandon us to our fate here. Uh, why? Because we, we did not see eh, uh, the rest of the church coming out strongly to uh, advocate our cause here, to talk uh, on, what is, what, what, on what was happening here. And also the rest of the world. Uh, we felt that there was a kind of conspiracy of silence over what was happening here. And uh, that didn't go uh, well really with us. We felt abandoned. As the world ignored the plight of northern Uganda, so did the people of southern Uganda. Even Ugandans were unaware and unresponsive to the violent war in the north. And e even me, you know, and I was concerned. I was living in the south. And we just keep reading about children being abducted, landmines going off, all of this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, after 10 or 12 years, I read over 20,000 children have been abducted. And I say, my God, you know, 10 here, 20 there, 50 there, you know, pretty soon it adds up. And this, this is the country, and then the world was very ob oblivious of this in general. It's hard for us as Americans to imagine. And what's incredible is this war went on for uh, well over 15 years before the international community started getting concerned about it. Even though the war still remains little known to many outside of northern Uganda, the effects of the war continue to be a challenging reality. Lillian, who spent most of her 16 years in a displacement camp, wants to be free of the nightmares that still haunt her. Sometimes I was having a bad dream. Even after now, I can dream those things. If, if during daytime I was thinking, especially when I was thinking my, about my parents, I can dream about those things. Sometimes I can dream that we were, I can dream like we were taken somewhere in the bush where people were killing each other. You can kill and cook that that passion you can do whatever there and even you can cut your friend you can use the panga to cut until that passion dies even you can chase each other with these spear things bad things all the things i can dream even after now The abductions of children were the worst nightmares of parents like Mama Angelina Atiem. 
Her daughter was one of the 139 girls taken from St. Mary's boarding school. 109 were rescued in a few days, but the rebels kept 30 of the girls. We waited and waited and waited. Then around evening, the deputy, the deputy headmistress of the school sent a message that she was coming back with some of the girls. And we walked towards the direction where they were coming from. We wanted to meet them on the way with the children. But when she looked at me, she turned away her face. And I knew she had no good news for me. Yeah. And that is when she told us 30 girls had been retained. My own daughter, Charlotte, who was 14 years, was one of them. And uh, I did not see her for seven years and seven months. Mama Angelina was not silent during that time. She and other parents of abducted children gathered for prayer and advocacy. Their voices became heard outside Uganda. This led to an offer from the rebels, eight months after her daughter was abducted, that forced Mama Angelina to make an unthinkable choice. Because at one point the rebels asked me whether I could keep quiet, not talk about crime against children, and then they would give me my daughter. I asked them, give all the children, then I will keep quiet. But um, they couldn't give me what I asked for. So later, when Charlotte came back, I asked her whether she was angry that I did not get her back. And I told her I could not get her, her back because she was only one. And there were thousands of children taken captive. And getting her back, would mean betrayal to other parents because they will also, they had their children there. And uh, I'm so happy because she understood it. There is peace now, though it is an elusive peace. There is no formal agreement because Kony fled from the talks to the Congo. But peace is more than the absence of war. Peace demands more when people are hungry, sick, and fearful. The idea of peace is intertwined with justice, with reconciliation, and with forgiveness. Peace is much more than, peace is the fruit of, of justice, of uh, establishing just uh, relationship between, uh, uh, between the, the parties. And we, we believe that it is a long way, uh, this is not a shortcut, but it is the only way which can indeed last, because it affects and it changes not just the external circumstances, again, but it can change the heart of people. For me, it means, first of all, uh, peaceful coexistence. But this harmonious existence should be uh, supported uh, by adequate you know, social services uh, in our community should also be supported by uh, ability to, 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 to sit down and talk when there is conflict, to listen to one another. Yeah, it, it may not necessarily mean that maybe there is no war. There can be no war, but if people lack what to eat, people are sick or sickly, uh, they can't send their children to school, I think um, you can't talk of peace. So the presence of all those could uh, w go towards peace. And of course, uh, peace to me as a priest would be also people loving God. When people talk of godly things, <laughs> then <laughs> that to me would be peace. An old man said, okay, to me peace would be that situation where the only thing I would be afraid of would be the snake, not a fellow human being. 
For Oyu Tobia Toby, who grows corn, millet, and cassava to feed his family, peace lies in being home in his village. So he's saying his life is now somehow more peaceful because he's earning something through digging and life is somehow now simple. Yes. While some people like Oyu have found a better life, many people are still picking up the pieces and are still struggling to find normalcy. Given the magnitude of human suffering, many have found it hard to forgive. However, some that we spoke to found that although forgiveness is difficult, it is essential to peace. People are very forgiving here. I mean, they're even willing to forgive Joseph Coney, who was the ringleader behind all of this, for the sake of peace. Mama Angelina embodies the power of forgiveness when she recounts the moment when she realized the true message of the Lord's Prayer. While her daughter and others were still missing, the parents often met to pray for the return of their daughters. Forgive us our sins, as you forgive those who sinned against us. It was a message for me and a message for us all. That day, in 1996, in October, is when the message became so real. We had to forgive the rebels if we wanted our children to, be, to come back. Because that is what we were asking from God. Please, help us get back the children. But I was telling them, unless we forgive, we will not be forgiven. And unless we forgive, we cannot ask anything from God. If we are so angry and bitter and hold them in our hearts, how can we pray? The intertwining paths of forgiveness, reconciliation, and justice pave the road to peace. The church continues its work for peace, for the most vulnerable, and for the dignity of all. Educating for peace, for the future, for opportunity, is seen as key. O'Shea Campione Jesuit College, the first Jesuit secondary school in Uganda, is providing what WAC sees as vital for the future, quality, value-laden education. We're trying to, to build up a core group of educated future leaders who have some, some values, hopefully have some concern for their people, and don't want to just get on a plane and go to England or Canada or the United States. Uh, which happens to a lot of the educated people here because they don't see opportunities in this country. And we want to educate these students on their own rights. And it, it seems to me that uh, justice isn't going to come until people start demanding it, okay? Nonviolently, hopefully, hopefully. We came to Uganda to discover how those who lived through the Ugandan Civil War are working to build and maintain peace but we realized it's not just their responsibility. We all have a collective obligation to work for peace. What I would love the world to know is that what touches somebody should also be our concern. And uh, my message is actually to the youth. You are so special, you young people, and you have still a long time to go, long journey to make. You, you have plenty of time to contribute to peace building or maintenance of sustenance of peace in the world. If 
and you are a, you are a generation not new not coming but you are here but you can transform things you can make it better because the youth have suffered more, more than us adults i think my past when i remember when the time we lived the systems in place was a little bit friendly but the youth please rise up those in peaceful countries rise up mobilize yourselves in groups and join up with youth in this war stricken parts of the world part of the continent and do something when time comes let god find you doing something to bring peace globally yeah statement indeed. Backpack journalism at its finest. On behalf of all of us at Creighton, thanks for watching. <laughs>